And uh, oh, just on behalf of the IME team, just like to welcome everybody back. Uh, this is one of our uh, keynote sessions uh, in, in the IMOOT. Um, and today we have Alton Leclerc, uh, who's a lecturer at Sojo University. I'm not sure, sure I said that right. Um, Alton has spent the last few years working with students and exploring ways in which the Moodle LMS can enhance the efficacy of instruction in second language listening. Uh, his primary concerns are with the issues of feedback and learner control and how they interact to improve learning outcomes. He has both a theoretical as well as a practical interest in this area and pitches his well-received presentations toward what is likely to be of use to classroom teachers. And today, uh, Alton is sharing his presentation on putting learners in the driver's seat, outsourcing control to improve outcomes. So I'd just like to formally welcome you, Alton. Uh, thank you for giving your time today uh, to share at IMET and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Shane, much, Shane. and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon or evening to all of you, uh, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, let me start by saying how, how pleased I am that you've chosen to listen and hopefully share with me. Uh, the title of my talk, as Shane mentioned, is Putting Learners in the Driver's Seat, Outsourcing Control to Improve Outcomes. If you had time to look over the outline, uh, you will have gathered that the issue of learner control is at the heart of what I'd like to discuss. What I have planned is uh, not so much a philosophical discussion about uh, learner control, learner autonomy, uh, learner agency, whatever term you want to use, but something that is, I hope, practical, relevant, uh, applicable in your context, whatever that might be. Uh, to that end, I will be uh, sharing uh, examples of some Moodle features and plugins that I think serve as good illustrations of the points I'm hoping to communicate. Uh, at this point, I should probably uh, explain why you can only hear me and not see me. Uh, we did attempt to uh, start the webcam, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get the front-facing camera to uh, work with Big Blue Button. Uh, all you could see was uh, a very close-up view of the clutter on my desk. Um, I suppose there's uh, some debate whether that was any worse than, uh, than actually looking at me. But uh, in case you think I'm being antisocial, uh, I'm not. Uh, it's just that uh, technically we couldn't get a camera up and running, so I do apologize for that. I'll do my best to uh, handsome clutter. OK, I'll do my best to follow the chat uh, as we go along. Uh, my plan, though, is to say my piece in about 45 minutes and use the rest of the time for discussion. Um, I should confess that uh, I'm hopeless as a multitasker. Uh, also, my my wife and pretty much anyone who knows me will confirm that my digressions are legendary. Uh, so please feel free to answer each other's questions that you might have uh, as uh, as we move along. Also, broach any unanswered questions uh, again at the end of the session, and uh, I'll do my best to provide a satisfactory answer. Before I begin the slideshow, uh, I should probably say a little more about myself uh, to supplement what Shane said in his introduction. Uh, I think that will help you contextualize uh, what's to come in the next 45 minutes. Firstly, most importantly, I'm a teacher. I work at a science and engineering university in Kumamoto, Japan. I'm strictly a language teacher. I don't instruct in any of the specialized areas offered by the university. My job is to improve the English proficiency of a constituency of students who in the past didn't pay much attention to language learning. Very challenging, engaging. A worthwhile thing to be involved with. So from Monday to Friday, I stand in front of my classes. That's the bulk of what I do. Uh, if you're not directly involved in teaching, uh, please don't leave. Uh, I think it's really important that uh, learning, teaching, and uh, development communities are aware of each other's concerns, uh, that we maintain communication. My own experience working uh, with developers is that they are often very interested uh, in seeing the end uses of their programming. Uh, there are endless examples, I think, of teachers using Moodle tools adaptively to achieve their pedagogical ends. Learning what Moodle can do and uh, seeing how it's put to use is a terrific learning opportunity for everyone involved. Turning back to myself for a moment, 
in addition to my teaching, I'm also a Moodle administrator. And from time to time, I'm able to commission a Moodle plugin uh, using research funds uh, generously provided by the Japanese government. Uh, but my passion for Moodle comes from the value it adds to the learning experience of my students. Before I start sounding too angelic, I will happily confess that I'm also very fond of Moodle's ability to lift certain burdens from me uh, as a teacher. I'm happy that I spend less time marking exams. I'm delighted that I no longer have to carry hundreds of student journals. I like that I can access student work from almost anywhere and at any time. And these are things that all of us appreciate, uh, but they are not the focus of my talk today. What I would like to talk about, uh, at the outset at least, is control. As teachers, we are trained to think a great deal about control, considering the differences among us in when and where we received our training. Our views about control will be uh, diverse, at the very least, and perhaps contradictory. The ideal power balance between teacher and learner depends on many different factors, uh, some of which I've identified uh, on this slide. As a Westerner working in Japan, I am very aware of how uh, important a role culture plays. However, uh, the effects of culture are also experienced at uh, the local and institutional levels. Policy also determines the, the balance of power and does so at national, local and institutional levels. Now, to complicate uh, matters, I think there's a disconnect between factors such as culture and policy and what we are beginning to understand about how promoting agency enhances learning. Other influences uh, on the dispersal of, of power include uh, the age of the learners, uh, the purpose of the learning, uh, and a good deal more. I think it's easy for uh, presenters like myself with uh, a microphone uh, and an audience to unconsciously embed cultural Hi, Alton, just jumping in in case you can't see the chat, just that we've lost your audio. Hello, everyone, am I back? Yes, can hear you fine, it's great, thank you. Okay. Okay, well, uh, now I only have to figure out how long I was uh, unmuted for. Uh, I did my best to follow the chat, but um, I couldn't be sure. What I was talking about, I think, uh, went out, was that uh, I'm going to uh, do my best uh, to uh, stay relevant to all of you who have joined in, regardless of what context uh, I'm working in. Um, I've experienced uh, many times myself uh, attending a session and walking away thinking something along the lines of, well, that might be fine in Scandinavia, but I work in Japan. Um, I'm mentioning this because I'm going to attempt to avoid this problem by focusing on what's possible in terms of enhancing learner agency in the Moodle ecosystem and leaving it up to you uh, to decide whether or not that's appropriate. Uh, of course, if I fail in this, or if you want to challenge some assumptions uh, I've made along the way, uh, uh, please feel free to do so uh, in the question and answer session at the end. To begin with, uh, to help emphasize the points I'll be making today, uh, I'd like to introduce a distinction between two functions that can be accomplished in Moodle. One is assessment or testing. 
the other is you can see from the, the bullet points, uh, my view is that assessment is more concerned with measuring knowledge than with understanding how it's acquired. Assessment has an administrative function. Uh, it provides numbers that we can put into grade books, assist in determining who graduates and who's. Learning is sometimes a little hard to define without reference to assessment. Uh, but I like to think of it as concerned with curating experiences uh, to bring about change or development in the learner. In many ways, uh, assessment or learning is a false distinction, but either or. The two functions can be and often are blended within Moodle. In fact, this graphic emphasizes perhaps the worst aspects of assessment and the best aspects of uh, pedagogy. But I'm doing this for a reason. Uh, assessment is a key aspect of a learning management system, and we wouldn't want to do away with it. But when we are discussing the issue of control, it's crucial that we differentiate between these objectives. Learning is engaged in a dynamic relationship with control, whereas, speaking, assessment is undermined by fluctuations in control. I think we all understand why and how to apply in an assessment context. We have to control where and uh, under what conditions students can access the assessment. We have to control the resources they can utilize. We have to control the time they are permitted to take. What I believe we don't understand well is how relinquishing control affects learning. What is the right amount of control to outsource? In what situations does it benefit the learner, and in what situation? I think we're, we're destined to make mistakes in the process of figuring this out. None of us has all the answers. In all the years of training I've had, though, formal and informal, I don't recall anyone ever telling me that the tools of assessment are of limited value in facilitating learning. I can think of many times during the course of my career when I attempted to construct learning experiences for my students using only the assessment toolkit. I did this across a, a long period of time, perhaps noticing, but I did have uh, an epiphany of sorts. Actually, let's not, let's not call it an epiphany, let's call it an aha moment. Uh, my aha moment came when I read a line written by Richard Caldwell who is a scholar in my area of specialization, with listening skills. With reference to teachers and teaching and how we attempt to facilitate learning for our students, Richard Caldwell wrote, we have made the mistake of allowing them to become the method. I imagine that statement might seem a little abstract. I'll select it out with an example from my teach in the past uh, in a former job one of my responsibilities was to prepare for the experience of studying abroad in an English-speaking country uh, during their study abroad experience these students would teachers in their field of study with the expectation that they would understand and benefit in some way all for the students was clear uh, they should be able to understand a 10-minute talk in English, delivered at normal speed, but without the aid of a transcript. That was the goal. And to help them achieve that goal, I uploaded uh, 20 or so 10-minute talks onto the in-house LMS. I wasn't using Moodle at the time. Provided no transcript. And to more accurately reflect the conditions the students would experience, I used a, a one-play audio player that could not be paused. Classic example, I think, of what Caldwell warns of. I mistook the goal for the method. I hope the students understand 10-minute lectures, force them to listen to 10-minute lectures. I think in many cultures, there's a strong tradition of learning by doing. Uh, let's throw them in the deep end. Sink or swim. Uh, when instructed this way, students tend to 
or give up. If they give up, we can blame their characters. Some students will learn this way, no doubt. Uh, but is this methodology the best that the profession has to offer? Or can we leverage technology and what we know about how people learn to do better for our students? My end of term test for those students who were preparing to study abroad was a pair of 10 minute lectures followed by comprehension questions. Considering the goal of the course, the assessment was probably appropriate. Uh, but what I asked the learners to do along the way was not. Uh, reflecting on this experience from earlier in my career is uh, humbling, a little embarrassing. But I'm sharing it because it shines a light on the fact that if we're not careful, we can easily misapply the tools intended for assessment. They may not be the ones we need to help learners progress where they are to where they want to be. Since I brought up this example from my own experience, I should probably spend a little time talking about what I would do differently now. And I encourage all of you to think about how the tools Moodle offers could have been applied to good effect in this case. What will become clear is that a lot of the things I'm suggesting relate back to the issue of control and placing control in the hand of learners. What would I do differently? Okay. First, I would take differences in the abilities of the learners into account. Remember that assessments are to treat everyone equally. They assume that everyone has had the same instruction and therefore a uniform measure ought to be applied uh, to judge how well they have mastered the content. Learning tasks, however, are different. Learning tasks should not treat everyone equally. They should acknowledge that some are ahead and some are behind. Some need more support and some need less. In Moodle, we could, for example, provide a glossary of key terms to some students and withhold it from others. We could use an audio player that uh, allows the learner to control the playback speed slower or even faster than normal. Some learners might benefit from having the content broken down into smaller chunks to reduce cognitive load. These are just a couple of ways to address the disparities uh, and provide the uh, of support to the learners. Found in the summary for this talk, uh, Moodle allows us to give learners the play button. And I mean that uh, figuratively, literally. And by doing so, uh, we allow for correction. It gives opportunities to repair breakdowns in understanding, uh, concentrate on areas that pose difficulties, skip over parts that are already understood. The learners can pause to analyze and reflect. They can pause to discuss and collaborate with others or consult external aids. All of these things enhance learning and all of them are made possible by outsourcing control. It's important to remember that control is granular in Moodle. It's not all or nothing. Uh, as a teacher, you can apply constraints to the amount of control the learner can exercise in a given context. For example, I could do a 10-minute lecture uh, in a timed quiz. The learners could pause or listen to sections again. Uh, but they would still be obliged to complete the listening and perhaps answer within a set period of time. Completion tracking and restrict access in Moodle courses allows teachers to withhold certain resources after a student has fulfilled criteria set by the teacher. Returning to the example of the 10-minute the lectures, uh, perhaps feels that learners could benefit from being able to view a transcript but they want them to first attempt to listen without this support. They can get access to the transcript until after the learner has listened to the lecture or after listening and completing some questions. In this way, the teacher can coerce a sequence 
that he or she feels will benefit the student's development. These are just a few things that come to mind. I'm sure all of you could provide more. Uh, indeed, I hope you do, uh, because I and all of the other iMOOC participants could benefit from your ideas. Now, I've probably heads with my own example, but I would encourage you to take a little time during the next few days uh, to reflect on those words of Richard Caldwell that I shared. Think about some examples from your own experiences in which you may have allowed to become the method and how you can find a way out of this practice which is essentially using assessment principles to achieve learning objectives. At this point in the presentation, I've portrayed uh, assessment uh, perhaps a little unfairly. Uh, in fact, what I've done is to discuss just one type of assessment, summative assessment. This is assessment that takes place after the learning has occurred, or perhaps more accurately, after the instruction has occurred. In reality, summative assessment offers uh, no views on the operation of, of learning and uh, how it can be done well. Uh, nevertheless, summative assessment is very important. It serves a number of valuable functions. I don't want to disparage it. What I want to make clear, though, is that uh, this type of assessment, tools and techniques, should not be deployed in the process of learning. It should not be presumed that summative assessment is an aid to learning. Generally speaking, it's not. Thinking that it is risks what Richard Caldwell warns about, mistaking the goal for the method. There is, however, a whole other type of assessment, uh, formative assessment, uh, that does have a valuable role to play in the learning process. In fact, it's instrumental to, uh, and as I hope you will see, it's also closely related to the issue of control. If you're new to the concept of formative assessment, I've included a helpful graphic uh, among my resources that was created by the Assessment Reform Group which explains the key aspects and objectives of formative assessment and does so in much greater detail than I'm able to provide here. You can find it on the course page uh, along with another document called Changing Assessment Practice, also by the Assessment Reform Group, which details uh, how you might go about facilitating a transition to a more formative assessment model. I encourage you to take a look at these uh, after the session if you haven't done so already. Uh, it's something I find myself uh, refer excuse me, referring to on a regular basis. The slide you're seeing at the moment summarizes some of the differences between summative and formative assessment. I'm sure there are others you could add. Uh, for the moment, the main points I would like to highlight about formative assessment are that it takes place alongside the learning process, it informs classroom practice, and it foregrounds goals and criteria, makes them explicit so that students understand what is expected and can plan ways to meet the objective. I think these two forms of assessment exist at opposite ends of a continuum. What I find interesting about Moodle is that changing certain settings affects where on the continuum a particular task is located. Uh, for example, concerning the quiz module, allowing only one attempt reflects a summative agenda. Multiple or unlimited attempts makes it more formative. Withholding a score from the learners you know, by unchecking grades from the review options is another example of how a teacher can prevent a summative focus from taking over. As my knowledge of Moodle, uh, I find that I'm often able to find new ways to build formative practices uh, into the learner's experience with the LMS. Uh, it gives me a, a great sense of satisfaction uh, when I'm able to find and adopt new ways of enhancing the learning experience. By far the most 
powerful tools for enacting formative assessment uh, in Moodle are the feedback options available. On a number of books, uh, including very recently, uh, I've heard uh, Mark Dugamus speak. Uh, and each time, uh, he's mentioned that we should always, always provide learners with feedback. I'm, I'm going to go off script for a moment and address something that uh, I think is very important. Uh, it strikes me that feedback is a little like exercise or watching what we eat. We all know we should be doing it, uh, but circumstances intrude. Uh, sometimes we can't be as faithful as we want to. I think this often leads to guilt among teachers, uh, which is unfair. Uh, I want to reinforce the message uh, of the value of feedback. Uh, it's been stressed uh, in so many presentations that I've watched uh, at this year's iMoot. But I also want to introduce ways of providing feedback that doesn't substantially affect a teacher's workload. I think that's something quite important. Talking to many teachers over the years, uh, uh, I've discovered that views differ as to what feedback is or is not. There are some who believe that grades constitute feedback and that by sharing grades with students, we are providing meaningful commentary. I would disagree with this view for a number of reasons, uh, the most important of which is that it's not actionable. There's no obvious recourse for the learner. Because the grade is fixed, there's no for remediation or retroactive. Even a learner's understanding of the contents or concepts uh, might increase in breadth and depth. The grade is insensitive to these developments and perhaps fosters a view that progress and understand isn't the point. I think all of us would agree that's uh, not a message we want to students. Second point on the slide refers to targets for the students to work towards. Targets can take many forms, uh, can do statements of them, and can be of great use to students. Uh, but in my field, uh, language teaching, it's better to show than to tell. So I like to provide students with samples of peer work, either prior to starting a task or after a task is complete, whatever is appropriate. People tend to think of this uh, only in relation to written work. Uh, but Moodle has ways to share learner-generated visual and spoken content. There are some uh, very nice voice recording plugins available that have had a profound impact uh, on the way that I provide formative assessment uh, to my students. Formative assessment attributes results to uh, mastery or lack thereof of the content, and it cannot take effort into account except indirectly. But formative assessment considers learner effort. Uh, for some of my students, being able to write or speak a simple sentence is a great achievement. More ambitious goals are appropriate. The best kind of feedback is sensitive to diversity and can provide motivation to those at being levels of proficiency. The next bullet point on the slide is an important one that once again relates back to the issue of control. A learning task and its associated feedback uh, should help the learner to decide what steps he or she ought to take next uh, in order to improve understanding of the content. Encouraging reflection uh, and offering choice are ways to empower learner to take the initiative in the learning process. Uh, the same is true of the last point relating to As teachers, we have limited time with our students. And we realize, I think, there are limits to how much we can do together. And that if their development is to continue after the course is finished, then the learners must acquire those to determine for themselves how well they understand the content, whatever it may be. 
these points I've raised uh, with regard to formative assessment and feedback are easy to agree with, uh, but perhaps harder to realize in your own practice. So I would like to dedicate the rest of my speaking time to outlining ways in which uh, Moodle can help you adopt formative practices, uh, facilitate learner agency, and hopefully improve outcomes. Because I've not uh, done much in the way of uh, <laughs> practical stuff, yes, Justin. Um, anyone who's uh, attended my uh, presentations in the past know that I'm a, I'm a great admirer of what I'm about to talk about next. I've also seen that it's featured in several other presentations that I've attended thus far. I should apologize in advance that my examples are drawn heavily from my own needs and experiences uh, as a language teacher. Wait, I'm just going to stop momentarily. I think Paula saying she's lost audio. Is she alone? Sorry, Paula. Uh, I'm afraid you can't even hear my apology. Hopefully, she'll get back on soon. Uh, anyway, uh, my examples are drawn heavily from experiences uh, as a language teacher, but I've tried to select examples of good practice that can be applied across uh, also hearing a low volume. Okay. Well, I do have the recourse to turn up the gain slightly on my microphone, which I'll attempt to do right now. Is the low volume problem being solved? Is it getting worse? Okay. Well, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, indicate on the chat whether you're having trouble hearing me. In the meantime, I'll talk a little closer to the microphone. Hopefully everyone will be able to hear me. With regard to the ideas that uh, I'm going to share, um, hopefully they can inspire your, your own innovations uh, that will meet your own challenges. Uh, so the first feature uh, that I'd like to introduce is something that was developed by Moodle Michael Durat functions as a valuable management tool for the teacher and a simple, intuitive source of feedback to the students. I'm speaking to Respar Block, which to the best of my knowledge is not a part of Moodle Core, but can easily be downloaded and installed on your Moodle. Uh, it was inspired by the progress bar that you see on your computer screen when you install a program or download something. Uh, the purpose of the original progress bar was to provide feedback uh, on the progress of processes that uh, are not otherwise visible to the user, uh, with the goal of preventing rake-off, uh, uh, which is <clears throat> when a user terminates an operation before it's finished. Uh, Moodle's progress bar has the same purpose. It provides transparency uh, in the form of expected in terms of work. Uh, it includes information on the expected date of completion. Uh, it can be configured to apply a performance standard that the learner must achieve in order for the task to be considered complete. It also serves as a collection of links to the actual tasks, uh, which allows you to keep your, your course page uncluttered. Progress bar can be applied to any activity, uh, and completion can be simply viewing the content. Uh, if it's a page, uh, submitting an assignment, posting to a forum, submitting a database entry, passing a quiz, there are very few limits on what it can monitor. Uh, every year, my university collects uh, a great deal of uh, student survey data on various aspects of our courses, and students have always responded very favorably to progress bar. Uh, they like the fact that they can find out from the beginning of the semester roughly how much work will be expected of them, uh, and they like to see their progress do that, do that content alone. Uh, to enhance the formative aspects uh, of the progress bar, uh, I'm careful to include feedback that equates the outcome with the effort the student has applied to the task. I have many tasks in which uh, a maximum score is quite difficult to achieve. However, uh, if the student can persevere to the point that they achieve a grade of 80%, then I make a resource page available that will help them to some score. Uh, doing this requires uh, an additional expenditure of effort, but the result is 
that the learner's knowledge of the contents enhanced. And it helps learners to attribute outcomes to efforts uh, beyond their first attempt at the task. I mentioned earlier the value of providing students with examples uh, of emerging and exemplary work. I use the word emerging uh, deliberately as opposed to weak or poor uh, because in an area such as language learning, many other areas as well I'm sure, the output is a product of the learner's knowledge and experience at a particular point. Not that it's representative of the skills they possess. These skills just happen to be insufficient to complete the task to the highest level. I think there's a, a temptation to include only examples of good student work. Uh, uh, this is a mistake, I think. Regardless of what you're teaching, uh, you'll find that your learners are places in terms of their understanding of the content. Of course, it's important that they can identify areas for improvement. But we also want them to recognize progress, accomplishment. And examples can help the learners to do that. However, you have to be careful how you present these examples. Uh, and that's what this slide is really all about. Uh, in my case, I've started using a couple of simple icons. And I'm attempting to use them consistently throughout my courses. Uh, you can see them here on the screen. Uh, their meaning is largely intuitive, uh, which uh, obviates the need for any undi undiplomatic uh, explanations uh, from me. I'm trying to use the, these three icons as sparingly as possible. Uh, this is my own example for the learners to consider. Uh, the problem, I think, with the teacher providing an example uh, is that students tend to regard it as the right answer or ideal answer. In reality, it's, it's just one possible example or interpretation. One of the big Moodle innovations for language teachers like me has been the arrival of voting plugins. Oral production is a very important skill. And the ability to capture speech acts in Moodle has been quite good for my teaching and my use of Moodle. During the year, I collect uh, many examples of students' oral production. And I'm able to mine this to enhance the feedback I provide to subsequent class. I'm able to do this uh, with the help of the Poodle filter. Uh, Kristen Hunt, who uh, is with us at the moment, a pool of a, a suite of plugins uh, that can greatly extend um, the ways in which students are able to demonstrate their understanding. Uh, there's voice recording, digital whiteboards, uh, lots of different audio players, widgets that can extend the functionality of virtually any part of Moodle. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to look into some of the, the great programming that Justin has done for the Moodle community. Uh, if you spend uh, any time in Moodle or around Moodle forums, then uh, probably everything I've said is redundant. Uh, I think he is uh, he's well known. Uh, back to uh, the Poodle filter. Uh, in the settings, there's a box that, if checked, shows a download icon next to every player in Moodle. Before you this is a, a privacy risk. Uh, the icon appears only to teachers, uh, those with higher level permissions. As I go through the students' recorded responses, I save example merging and advanced work, which I then add to the relevant feedback fields. So what students see in the review area after submitting a quiz is their own audio response, along with examples of peer response labeled with the appropriate icons, uh, the ones that uh, you can see on the screen. I think this will be much easier to process if you can see an example. Uh, what you're looking at here 
uh, is the quiz review. So the student has answered the questions uh, submitted and is now being presented with the feedback. Uh, I'll just attempt, if I can, to circle these areas. Quite hopeless with, uh, with the mouse. But what you're seeing here, and again here, are those download icons which I mentioned earlier. Okay, clicking those is what allows me to collect the student responses. Um, remember, those are visible only to teachers, uh, not to students. Uh, what you're seeing up here is the student's response. Okay. And down here is the feedback. So we have a schematic okay, of the sentence uh, with information about pronunciation, stress, intonation, uh, the, well, the elision that occurs with the terminal T sound is represented, uh, and below that is a, a model of a sentence uh, as spoken by a native speaker. Okay, again, you can see the appropriate icon in there that will, that will indicate to the student uh, that it is a native speaker. I would expect uh, the students to listen to this alongside their own response, looking for differences and areas of improvement. With this kind of task, I always uh, allow unlimited attempts so that the students can go back uh, and attempt to more closely match their pronunciation to that of the model. Uh, by the way, uh, this feedback uh, that I provided here was inserted into the general feedback section of the question itself. Uh, this feedback is specific to the question. Uh, and wouldn't be effective if I had placed it in the overall feedback for the quiz. Of course, doing this um, requires an expenditure of time and effort on the teacher. But after it's been accomplished, the teacher no longer needs to go through and grade individual responses. After the quiz or question, learners are presented with the examples and instructed to assess and reflect upon their own performance. Of course, uh, it goes without saying that if you if you intend to include student responses in the feedback, uh, please be sure to obtain permission from the individuals involved before going ahead. Uh, my personal experience is that uh, students are are happy to uh, allow their, their audio recordings to be used. Uh, some have granted permission uh, with the caveat that uh, they wait until after they've, uh, they've graduated from that particular class uh, before using But on the whole, I've had no troubles uh, obtaining permission. We all know that uh, a learning management system is good for binary forms of assessment, where there's a clear right answer. Uh, it turns up in the grade book. But what do you do in situations where understanding can't be demonstrated by selecting the correct option in a multiple choice question? I'm talking about open response. Uh, grading open response questions requires a huge amount of effort on the part of the teacher. So why not outsource some control? Uh, and engage the students in their own work. In my earlier slide on formative assessment and feedback, uh, I mentioned that we should attempt to facilitate decision making about how to improve understanding. Uh, this is something that's made possible by, and I'll give you another example to demonstrate. Now, after completing a quiz to certain content from the course, the teacher could use the overall feedback section to provide learners with options about what they would like to do next. Uh, on the slide, you can see a screenshot uh, of what this could look like. In this instance, the students uh, watched a video in English and answered some questions related to the content. Now, it's quite unlikely that the learners, uh, uh, they, they probably didn't have perfect understanding of everything contained in the video. Uh, but what they require to help them fill in the gaps is left up to them. As you can see from my note on the right, uh, 
every option is actually a link to the described resource. Um, probably make my links open as, as pop-ups so that the learner could easily access the other option in the event that they think a few or all of these choices would benefit their understanding. I mentioned earlier that uh, hallmark of formative assessment is that it promotes an understanding of the gold criteria. Simple direct grading uh, for Moodle assignments uh, does not facilitate that understanding. Uh, but rubrics, uh, which are available in the advanced grading options, uh, do. I won't go into the details of how to define a rubric. Uh, I'm sure there are some YouTube videos that can do a much better job than I. Uh, but I will show you uh, what a rubric provides to the student in the way of feedback. I don't expect that most of you will be able to uh, this particular rubric, uh, but it outlines for my Japanese students how different levels of performance will be assessed. Uh, this rubric, any rubric, can be shown to the students before the task uh, and as a part of the feedback that accompanied. Um, I think maybe I'll come back to you. Sorry, Dot, I've, I've picked up your question there, but I think maybe I'll come back to that a little bit later, uh, if that's all right. I'll just finish with the rubric first. Uh, the sections that are highlighted in green uh, show the student where uh, on the rubric their performance fits uh, and give some guidance as to how they can. Uh, I'm going to abuse the fact uh, momentarily that I have a, a captive audience, uh, including, I hope, some developers. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, rubrics are an area of Moodle where uh, the multi-lang feature uh, does not function. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, multi-lang tags allow users in, uh, to see Moodle content in their own language uh, if, if it has been translated and surrounded with the appropriate tags. Uh, however, multi-lang tags uh, do not in the text input areas, at least not on the version of Moodle that I have. Uh, so, uh, this is a shame. Uh, I think it would be very handy in my context if uh, teachers uh, could view it in their native language, English in this case, and learners could uh, see it in their own. Uh, so uh, if the right person is listening, uh, perhaps this could be incorporated uh, into future versions of Moodle. Okay, I'm seeing uh, a fair bit of chat about uh, my sound. Uh, I couldn't say for sure whether this is uh, a technical issue or if it's just uh, the fact that my voice is starting to peter out. Um, if the problem uh, persists, there is cloud over Japan. Japan. In fact, there was also a, a recent volcanic eruption. Uh, perhaps ash is uh, preventing a good I'm turning up my gain a little bit. See that helps. Okay. I think I'll just carry on and uh, perhaps do my best once again to direct my voice toward the microphone. There's one more thing I want to uh, squeeze in uh, before we move on to questions. Uh, I think it's a familiar experience among teachers that we can see a way to improve Moodle for our students. We lack the technical know-how resources to make it happen. Now, recently, I've found something that can help to address this issue uh, for an intrepid teacher uh, who's willing to try something new uh, in order to get some extra functionality out of Moodle. What I'm talking about is a Moodle filter uh, called the Generico filter. It allows teachers, admins, uh, managers uh, to create templates using snippets of code, either self-created or taken from elsewhere. Uh, and they can be used to additional functionality within Moodle. I want to stress at this point that I'm not an expert on Generico. In fact, I've probably already uh, misstated slightly what it does. Uh, the creator, once again, is with us, Justin Hunt. Uh, 
I think the inspiration for Justin was that he realized people often wanted to add some extra functionality in Moodle, but that developing a whole new standalone plugin in order to make that a reality would be overkill. I think it's probably difficult to imagine what Generico is and what it does without an example. Uh, so I'll, I'll share one of my own with you. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, a number of times, my area is second language listening. And I spend a lot of time thinking about how I can assist the students in understanding oral texts uh, and facilitate automatic processing. Uh, research has discovered that one of the biggest factors uh, affecting listening comprehension is delivery. This is not particularly surprising. Uh, modulating the speed will affect the comprehension of different learners differently. This is useful to know, but for a long time I there was nothing I could do with this information. A lot of my audio materials are created by myself and my co-teachers. But no one was very enthusiastic about producing each recording at different speeds. And even if we did, how would we choose which speed to give to which group of students? It would be far better if the learners themselves had a tool to modulate the speed according to their needs. As luck would have it, I attended a presentation in which a teacher researcher had created a multi-speed audio player for Moodle using the Generico filter. I exchanged cards with him, uh, and a couple of days later, he sent me the code I needed to get the audio player up and running on my Moodle. Uh, you can see the player on this slide. It has some simple, intuitive icons. Uh, the same icons, uh, incidentally, which I'm using uh, for the example work that I provide to the students. Uh, the learners just click on these icons to modulate the speed of the audio that they're here. Uh, we have called this the Adam player, uh, named after Adam Murray, uh, the teacher who created it. Uh, I noticed earlier on that uh, one of the people joining us is from Miyazaki. Uh, if so, you're sharing a locality with Adam, uh, who also works in uh, Miyazaki here in Japan. What I love about this is that it can be of use in so many different contexts. It's not specific to language learning. To record lectures and put them up on Moodle, this player could help uh, limited English proficiency students, or perhaps those who take notes while they listen. If the learner is already familiar with the content, they can play it at a higher speed as a quick review. I think this is a, a great example that can be done to redistribute control uh, in a way that benefits all stakeholders. Wow, I'm even getting up there that uh, uh, that uh, you might be a co-worker of Adam. Uh, well, there uh, can't be too many Adams around, uh, so let's assume it's true. Okay. Um, I think it's time that uh, I wrap things up and uh, more actively in the chat. Uh, my parting message, the same that I've been emphasizing throughout the presentation, and uh, it's summed up quite well uh, in this paradoxical. I think that as teachers, we're choosing control, rightfully so. What I'm advocating is not to lose control. Uh, but to strategically relinquish control over things that are likely to enhance learner agency uh, and improve learning outcomes. Thank you to all of you uh, for taking the time to listen to me speak. Um, we have lots of time left, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we can now start uh, a very vibrant question and answer. I've been hearing only my own voice, uh, and uh, the same is true for all of you. Uh, so if possible, uh, I would like uh, people to take hold of the microphone and uh, allow, allow the rest of us to hear your voice. Is there anyone willing to do that? Or are there any questions that people would like to throw out? Uh, 
Uh, okay, Dot has uh, written a question here, which I'll read out. Um, she's asking, uh, would you limit access to a transient hotel after the students had explored more challenging options? Uh, yes, that is certainly what I intended, the uh, example that I provided earlier. I think that, um, you know, when you're dealing with students at varied levels of proficiency, uh, and this is not only this is not only uh, an English uh, or an instruction point, uh, but in, in any field, I think that uh, there are always students who will who will reach for a lifeline before they need it. Uh, and one of the great things I like about it is that uh, it allows you to to coerce a sequence, uh, to force students to go through uh, a challenging experience and giving them the help if they need it, if and when. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, explain a little bit more. Are, are you talking about handwritten comments? Um, from, from me that I've typed in individually to the students? I think this is always uh, desirable, if possible. Um, but I am sensitive to the fact that uh, really providing comments um, at all times can be a terrific burden to teachers. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to find ways to automate uh, the give back, which is still uh, in some way. Um, I do find that, uh, you know, when I'm marking uh, one journal after another, the comments that I tend to write uh, tend to be, well, ones that are probably not that inspirational to the students. Uh, things like, good job, very good. That tends to get repeated. In fact, uh, I will guiltily confess that sometimes I've, I've cut and pasted uh, or I've cut my comment and pasted it into uh, into the feedback area for students. I hope I've not exposed myself uh, too much, and that <laughs> that there are other people who could at least uh, understand uh, that uh, that that's necessary at times. Uh, sure, who wouldn't? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, your, uh, to answer the technical uh, Moodle question, there are uh, boxes available um, in which you can write feedback. Uh, I think, and anyone else might correct me, there you can actually include feedback uh, to each criterion that you've defined in the rubric, uh, in, in which case uh, the feedback would allow you to comment specifically on, uh, in my case, maybe pronunciation or, or uh, you know, lexis or correctness. I could, I could address those individually or I could give a more general uh, comment uh, after. Yes. Yes. So it's possible to give very specific comment on each element of the rubric. Um, also to give a, a more general comment at the end. I think this is great functionality that Moodle has added to the rubric. Uh, once again, though, I am sensitive to the fact that you know a rubric is intended to help the students but it's also to help the teachers in some ways. Uh, and if a teacher feels obliged to comment uh, on every criterion defined in the rubric, uh, then it's then quite soon uh, the burden is income uh, on teachers. So I think that uh, you know while I would applaud anyone who who can take that much uh, take that much care over responding to their student work, uh, for, for many that's probably not a reality. Is there anyone else who would like to jump in? I wonder then maybe if I could uh, perhaps just ask um, if any people have uh, used themselves uh, some of the some of the, the things that I mentioned uh, in my presentation today. For example, are there people who actively use the progress bar in Moodle?
I'm not sure what this rather long silence in the chat means. Uh, okay, we've got some comments in here. <clears throat> I think Marin's comment is uh, is uh, true in my situation as well. Um, it's been wildly popular with the, the students in the um, thought also uh, weighing in that it's really useful. Okay. Yeah. Other ways, I think, to uh, to have the same effect. Uh, I think the course completion, open badges. There are a number of ways that uh, we can keep students, uh, keep giving students feedback, uh, and uh, be sure to to maintain motivation. I think um, one thing that's uh, a bit of a challenge about the progress bar block is that it's at its most useful when all of the content is there and ready to go before the course begins. Uh, when I first started using the progress bar block, I didn't have my content in place. And as a consequence, the progress bar had things uh, on it at the beginning of the semester. And then each week, a couple of more things were being added to it. Uh, I think that that's not an effective use of the progress bar generally. Uh, everyone has to start somewhere. Uh, but I think its primary benefit is to give the students uh, a clear overview of what's expected uh, in terms of output um, over the course of uh, of their study, uh, and to have it all there, uh, all clearly signposted in terms of deadlines, uh, is very useful. Uh, Justin's asking a question um, of Lynn uh, about uh, whether or not parents can see the progress bar. Mm. This is one of those moments when I wish Michael Durat was with us. My feeling is that they can't automatically see that information, uh, but I imagine um, if an appropriate role has been created within Moodle, uh, then that would become possible. This is uh, a great moment, perhaps, to once again uh, plug Justin and his programming. Uh, Justin can, can weigh in either on the microphone or just through the chat. Uh, but he has created something uh, which is uh, called Family. Am I getting that right, Justin? Uh, which is, uh, how would you describe that? Uh, a kind of role uh, that allows uh, a parent, for example, uh, access to certain aspects uh, of their, their child's uh, Moodle course, uh, perhaps aspects of the grade book or something like the progress bar. Okay, I assume that uh, all of you have read uh, Justin's comment. Uh, by the way, uh, no worry about stealing the show. There probably wouldn't be uh, if not for uh, for you and all the all the help that you've given me uh, over the past couple of years. Okay, a little bit more explanation from Justin there. Also, um, my course page that uh, that was created for this for this talk, uh, I've included some screenshots that give a few more examples of feedback uh, in action. I think that um, you know, in the Russian hustle of making content for students on Moodle, uh, we sometimes forget uh, or perhaps just neglect uh, to fill out those feedback uh, fields um, if you can manage it. Um, creates a much more uh, rewarding and formative experience uh, for the students as they as they proceed through through these online activities. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, uh, add a question, uh, perhaps a comment on something that we've discussed up to this point. OK, 
Okay. Um, yes, I, uh, I very selfishly plugged that, um, at least in the version of Moodle that I'm using, uh, multi-lang uh, available. I think it's because the, uh, the areas in which you define the rubric are text input areas and not full-blown HTML editors, uh, which I imagine would enable uh, using multi-lang tags. Um, is there anything else that uh, Moodle could, could be improved in Moodle to outsource control? Um, okay, I'll, I'll quickly answer Melanie's question, uh, two points, uh, and then I'll go back. Um, is there anything else? Uh, I think that there are things, uh, but I'm, I'm a little hesitant to mention them just because uh, I think that it will end up with me talking very specifically about my, my field, which is second language instruction and uh, especially, uh, especially second language listening skills. Um, <clears throat> I would feel more comfortable, uh, actually, if someone else could uh, introduce a suggestion of what, uh, what might help uh, to uh, outsource a little bit more control to, to the learners in the process of interacting with, uh, with Moodle. Okay, some interesting chat going back and forth. Uh, I'm always interested uh, to hear about self-assessment. Um, in fact, I've attended uh, several presentations so far in this uh, iMoot uh, that have provided some very interesting ideas. I think something which I'm quite interested in the moment is the workshop module, which uh, unfortunately I've not had so many attempts to use. Uh, elf. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, there's a great opportunity for self and peer assessment um, in the workshop module. Uh, my main challenge at the moment is uh, that I'm looking for a way to use the Moodle workshop module uh, within a single face-to-face -face class session. I think normally uh, the life cycle of something like the workshop module is intended to go on uh, a little bit longer, uh, perhaps over days or even weeks. Um, but because of the nature of the classes I teach, um, sort of erratic that I sometimes experience, uh, I really am looking to uh, find ways to use Moodle uh, synchronously uh, in the class time, uh, another area of particular interest to me. Um, Okay, I'm just going to address uh, Deborah's uh, question. Uh, yeah, that text input area when you're defining the rubric, if you wanted uh, something like multi-lang tags to work, then yes, you would have to uh, arrange that translation uh, yourself. Uh, so in the HTML ed uh, editor, um, you have your instructions or your feedback, whatever it might be, uh, in, in English, uh, as an example. And then in, in my situation, I would also have that in Japanese uh, inside the uh, multi-lang tags. And what this would allow us to do is, um, if you have uh, various languages enabled on your Moodle, if the user your language from English to, uh, in my case, Japanese, uh, then that would activate those multi-lang tags throughout your Moodle, uh, and it would present the students with the Japanese cont rather than the English. Hi, Alison, it's Shane here. I just thought I'd just quickly jump in this little pause uh, just to formally thank you for taking the time out today uh, to present. Um, very thought-provoking uh, presentation, um, but I really appreciate your time uh, and uh, certainly appreciate everyone getting involved as well. Um, and I certainly don't want to cut off the questions. You're most welcome to keep going, but just to say thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Shane. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, 
Yes, uh, by all means, uh, um, keep the chat going. As well, of course, the forum will be open. Uh, I am subscribed to that and will happily check in. Um, I think the, the great benefit uh, of an opportunity like this when uh, maybe people in different capacities who are Moodle users can come together, uh, we can share ideas and hopefully keep a conversation going uh, beyond the actual little bit of time that we share together. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, and uh, please uh, feel free to uh, stay behind a little bit longer and ask questions um, of me uh, individually or add any questions or comments you have to the forum. All right, I can see people going uh, one by one. Um, if any of you still want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, to say something, uh, I really look forward to hearing. Okay, it's confirming 2.8. Uh, none of the filters, uh, including multilang, are applying to rubric text. Okay, I think that's very useful information. Uh, yeah, a tracker issue would be great. Uh, I would put on that. Um, perhaps I should get busy and create the issue myself since uh, since I brought it up beats me to it uh, uh, then uh, please uh, make sure that you uh, you put that uh, tracker issue uh, form uh, so that anyone who listened could follow up with votes uh, and hopefully we can have that changed uh, for a subsequent version of Moodle Uh, Deborah, if you're still if you're still there, uh, do you believe that uh, Adam is uh, is a coworker of yours? Uh, I well, it's a small world. Um, yes, uh, I uh, I owe him a lot uh, for providing what's become a useful little addition to our Moodle. I believe he created that uh, three-speed audio player uh, uh, to assist his research. Um, which was to do with, uh, I believe, T, uh, but it's become really helpful uh, for me uh, and all our courses now. I'll be sure to say hi to Kumon. Thanks so much.